All right, we're live. So, hey everyone, my name is Marie Cruz, and with me, I have my colleague today. Hi, I'm Nicole Vanderhoeven. I'm her colleague, and I'm a little <laughs> sick, but I'm here. <laughs> So we um, today we're actually going to be uh, doing the first ever recording for the Adobo and Avocados podcast. Um, so we thought about this name and initially like Nicole and I wanted to, you know, ever since before we wanted to launch a uh, podcast where we can talk about, you know, our experiences working in tech and all other things. And then we thought about the name Adobo and Avocados. So um, you know, to anyone who doesn't know, so we're both from the Philippines and avoca- um, adobo is the national dish um, of the Philippines. So that's why we thought we'll add the name um, of um, adobo in our podcast title. Um, avocados, because we're both developer advocates. But yeah, I think why don't we discuss like, why was it called <laughs> avocados in the first place? Do you have yeah, any but we don't it? really know for sure. So yeah. I thought that it was something to do with the language of it. Like, you know, an advocate is usually like a could be like a lawyer in, in common non-tech um, s- senses. And the translation for that is abogado in Spanish or, or, or Tagalog, Tagalog, actually, our yeah. native language. So it's like kind of similar to oh, avocado. I don't know. That's kind of what I thought. <laughs> yeah, that's actually an interesting um, thought. Like, because the yeah, av- avocado does sound very, you know, similar to avocado. But I actually read this one article where um, I think their project manager had a hard time saying developer advocate. They ended up saying developer avocado. So who knows what the origin is, but. Yeah, I think it's it's a great, you know, um, you know, um term in terms of like, you know, the whole play, um, like playful um, you know, meaning behind um the word developer advocate. Um, so yeah, I guess first things first, like, you know, um who we are, like um why are we doing this podcast? Um, how you know we got into tech. So we'll talk first about, I guess, a bit of some introductions um about ourselves. So Nicole, why don't you start? Like, um, how did you get started? <laughs> um, you know, what's been your I guess background so far? Did you had a traditional, you know, computer science background, or did you do like a different I guess, course back when you were still studying? I did not have a traditional background. I I grew up in the Philippines. I moved away when I was 18. And I don't know what your experience was, Marie, but Mm -hmm. mine was that in the Philippines, there are still, I, I think we do a pretty good job at being equal between genders, but I think there are still gender roles. And I, I, when I was growing up, I really loved both the maths and sciences and like mm-hmm. literature and languages, but I was very heavily pushed towards the, the humanities because that's what girls do. Girls don't mm-hmm. go into tech. And so I really struggled at, at uni and in college. I shifted majors six times. I had no idea wow. what I wanted to do. And I went through, and that was over two countries. I went to the U.S. Mm-hmm. to study as well. None of them was computer science because my brother was a developer. And I don't know, he's a little too introverted for me. And I, mm-hmm. I just had this idea that yeah, if I go into computer science... I have to be a developer, and if I'm a developer, I won't talk to anyone. I'm just going <laughs> yeah. to be with a machine. Like I had that in mind, which now I know is completely wrong, but yeah. that's why I never went into it. So at, at, finally, my parents were just like, we don't care what you finish. I, we don't yeah. care if it's basket weaving. Just pick a major and finish it. <laughs> and yeah. that was economics. <laughs> Which oh. I have never used in a job. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, then that's so really interesting, yeah. And then I um how did I get into IT? I I was applying for different economics related ones, and then I met my now husband <laughs> and he Hi, he was a test manager. Yeah, yeah. hi Rob. <laughs> <laughs> He 
he was a test manager. And I said, well, what's a test manager? And then he told me about the world of testing. And yeah. I didn't understand it at first, but I wanted to know more. And then I thought the way that he described it sounded so interesting, like the idea mm-hmm. that that there is a job, there is a person whose job it is to be the one using applications or, or products first and then trying to see what's wrong with it for the purposes of improving it. I just, I really loved that idea. Mm-hmm. And it was another branch of tech that I didn't know existed. So yeah. I started to, I did um, an ISTQB certification just to like have something because I didn't have any background. Yeah. And I started job hunting and somehow managed to land a performance testing job under um, someone who became my mentor. Mm, nice yeah it's it's really relatable because like similar with myself I fall into tech accidentally like it was never my intention you know okay I'm gonna study computer science although I did actually have a computer science degree but the story the story behind that um it's uh, I don't share it too much to other people because I think the story behind it is a bit funny but uh, my first experience with tech is actually updating my my space profile. Do you remember my space? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, before you can customize your profile with a bunch of HTML, uh, CSS codes, and like, I think before I was just trying to, you know, create something, even though it didn't look very accessible. I remember I had lots of animations, just lots of like striking oh. fonts, background music, and it was just something that I was doing for fun. Um, I did a mass communications course back home in the Philippines. Um, so I was majoring in digital media. And then I had to go back. Um, here in the UK. So I was working first for about two years before I decided to go back to uni. And during that time, when I was looking at, you know, courses catalog, because I wasn't really sure what to pick. So I saw a course which basically has uh, three different things. So it's computer science with business management and financial accounting. So I thought, oh, wow. Okay. I was like thinking in my head, I think that sounds like a really cool name for a course. So I'm going to go for it. So to me, I just found the name <laughs> like very interesting. Um, and so it, when it did you move again. out of the Philippines? So I, so we went back 2008. Uh, so I was in the UK since 2004. Um, actually, no, we went back 2006 and then I went back in the UK 2008. So 2006, um, I enrolled, you know, to study mass communications. I didn't finish the course because I had to go back in the UK after two years because of um, like visa um, like status. And then when I got back, I just put that into a pause, you know, did some work um, experience. So I was working as an office assistant for about two years. And then my friend and I just decided, okay, I think we should go back to uni. Um, so I actually applied as a mature student because I didn't, you know, had any like actual qualifications because I never graduated from my degree um, in the Philippines. I never finished high school as well because I kept going back and forth between the UK and the Philippines. So the last time I actually graduated was during middle school. Um, but applying oh, wow. as a mature student, they just... Um, looked at my, you know, work credentials, like my work attitude. And I submitted some of my grades, like back, you know, when I was still in the Philippines, because like my first two years, I had some, you know, grades from like the different subjects that I was doing. Um, But yeah, that's how I got into tech. I just found the name, like really interesting. And I thought before I could mix and match it with business and accounting. So even if the computer science bit didn't work out, like I can still maybe utilize some of the things that I've learned on the business side and on the accounting side. Um, and then when I was about to look for um, graduate jobs, I um, got approached by a 
um, testing consultancy company. I didn't, I wasn't aware that there's a graduate job for, you know, just doing testing because most of the graduate jobs that, you know, we were um, being offered is, you know, how to, you know, do like development or like database, um, like um, management roles. So initially, I wasn't really sure if I wanted to do the developer uh, route. Like I en- I enjoyed the coding. I was doing the coding bit, but like back then, um, I wasn't like fully 100% sure that it was the right uh, path for me. So I found out that, yeah, you can have a career in testing. Again, this is all accidental because if that testing company did, did, uh, didn't approach me, I would have probably looked at like other roles. So um, it was like really uh, great to hear that, yeah, there's like a graduate jobs for just doing testing. Um, and yeah, we were doing the ISTQB as well. So we were doing some uh, training. And yeah, the rest is history. It's it's funny because I didn't intend to continue on a developer route, but then now I work as a developer advocate. <laughs> Yeah, maybe we should talk about that a bit because I also don't consider myself as a developer, even Mm. though I can code. And yet somehow we're both developer advocates. (laughs) How did that happen? It's like there's some sort of, I guess, interesting link between software testing and developer advocacy. Um, I don't know like if it's the same for you, but like with me, um, I really enjoy the teaching part, the learning in public part as well. And when I was doing my role as a software tester, I I felt that I was doing the advocacy, but maybe, you know, not really in a way that it's very out there. So I was, you know, helping my colleagues. I was talking about tools that I've learned, you know, with them. I was showing them how to use it. And then while I was working as well, like I started doing the learning in public on the side. So I started with my uh, personal blog and then getting involved, you know, with meetups to talk about, you know, the different tools that I've learned. So um, I guess for me, like being a software tester also, um, you know, um, encouraged me to, I guess, be a developer advocate because I was just telling people what I've been doing as a software tester. I've been telling them what different tools I've been using, you know, different concepts that I've been um, learning as well on like a day-to-day. So is that the same uh, for you? For me, it was more because I was I was a consultant, which means mm-hmm. um, I was going on different projects all the time. Yeah. And when you're really new in an industry, I think it's really exciting and you're learning a lot. And certainly every project has like its own framework and different languages and different people, which is interesting for a while. But I don't know, after several years of it, I started to feel like people are actually asking the same questions. You know, there's always, there's some things that I always had to explain you know, I always had to, for example, fight against the fact that performance testing is often seen as just something where you run the test, okay, you check the box, Mm -hmm. you've done performance testing. There's Mm -hmm. always a certain amount of education where I'm like, no, it's not just about checking the box. It can actually provide real value. Here's how. And I just found myself repeating a lot of the same things. And so I actually Mm -hmm. started to create videos Also because load testing results are kind of difficult to explain sometimes. And I would create this like test summary report that lots of people don't read. And so as kind of an alternative way to explain things, I started creating video summaries to go along with it. And then I just thought, well, maybe I can, because I can't publish those because it's very specific to that company. Yeah. But then um, I I thought maybe I can pull out, I can abstract away some things and then publish those videos where I'm not talking about a specific project. And I guess that's kind of how it started. Um, I started 
I put it into text first because that's just mm -hmm. easier than video. And then eventually found myself to into video anyway. So yeah. I guess for me, I, I got into developer advocacy because I was tired of, I, I was trying to automate a part of my life, the explanation part where I kept having to say the same things. And I just wanted to be like, hey, read this blog post where I explain why you need think time in a much more coherent and considered way. Yeah. That's That's how it naturally happened. I think you and I are the same in that regard that we were already doing it before we yeah. got the title. I, I I I totally relate to that. Like especially when you said that like we're just trying to solve the same problems. Um I I started, you know, my blogging um journey just trying to communicate like you know questions that people have been asking me on a day-to-day -day basis. And rather than just you know, speaking to individual people and repeating the same things, like, again and again, like, just put everything into a post or, like you said, like, a video and then just share that, um, you know, like, to the public. Because um, you're not only going to be able to help, like, one person, but, you know, maybe if someone else is stumbled upon your blog or your video, then, like, you might help them as well. Um, I think, like, one of the, um, like, one of the best reward that I experienced when doing this, like learning in public and, you know, sharing more content out there is if you just get a message from someone or like a comment and then they say that, oh, like I, I, I've been stuck with the same issue. I found your blog post or your video and it really helped me. And just that feeling that, you know, you've helped someone um, is like a really great feeling because at first, I wanted to blog as well, just so that I can have something that I can look back to in case I, you know, forget, like, what I've done on a previous project, like, I can document it on a blog post. But then, like, now it's also helping, like, other people who are experiencing the same, like, issues at work. Yeah, I, I definitely see that. At first, I was doing these things for myself because, you know, you don't really know that you know a subject until you can teach it to some degree. And I and I really believe that. And I, for me, there were so many things because as a consultant, you have to switch tools very quickly. You have to switch languages. You have to be a polyglot in, in, on a lot mm -hmm. of different levels. And it's impossible to keep all that in your mind. So after every project, I tried to like distill my learnings from it so that yeah. I, I future me would come back to that framework or, or tool or whatever and not be starting from zero. But yeah, yeah. the kind of other people finding it was an unexpected boon. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's just move on a bit. So we've talked about, you know, how we transition from software testing to developer advocacy. But I guess in terms of like the process, like did you apply to a lot of, you know, companies? Was developer advocacy something that, you know, you were aware of already or like you just found a job description and then you're like, oh, this is what I do already. Okay, let me apply to that job. So what's been like the process for you? So I was, this is only, this is my first job as a, an actual, like the first job where I have developer advocate in my title. My yeah. previous job was with a, well, at the time it was a startup. It was Flood.io, which is now acquired by Tricentis. Yeah. And when I joined, I think I was like, I think the fifth person that they hired in the team. Oh, wow. So it was very small. And um, it was, I really love that environment because you can do a lot of things. You can wear multiple hats. And that's really where it started. On a typical day, I might be answering questions and support or mm -hmm. presenting at a conference or ducking into a sales call or like there were yeah. so many things that I could do. I was like part of the, the rotation for um, for things going down, basically, for things exploding. And I had to learn a lot about infrastructure as well to be competent in that role. 
And I started doing a lot of advocacy type things, mainly from a support perspective, because I got the same questions there as well. And I I wanted to be able to focus on the crunchier topics. And you can't do that unless you address some of the more basic quests or common questions. And then my manager at the time told me about developer advocacy and my immediate response was, but I'm not a developer. (laughs) He said, oh, but that's that's just the name for the whole industry that I think you would be really good at and that you're already doing. And with his with his encouragement, this is Tim Koopmans, the one of the co-founders of Flood. He um he with his encouragement, strong encouragement, by the way, things like he he said, Oh, I've got this conference in Moscow that I'm speaking at. Do you want to come watch me? And yeah. I said yes. And he backed out. So I had to do it, things <laughs> like that. <laughs> because of things like that that he that he did. I started to understand what developer advocacy is. And mm-hmm. when it was when I felt it was time to change directions, yeah. I specifically looked at K6 actually. I didn't apply to any other jobs because I was pretty happy where I was, but mm-hmm. I really loved K6. I'd already not used it in a project, but I'd already I knew what what the tool was and I'd used it. I tested it a bit. I love the site. I love the principles behind it. And I saw that they had a developer advocate role. So yeah. it, it just kind of happened. <laughs> How about you? Well, the first time I heard about the term was from you <laughs> when when you said that hey, we've got we've got this role. For you know, like you know, like we've we've got a developer advocate role for one of the tools that you know we're gonna launch. Like you'll be like the great fit. So I I didn't really send any CV. I don't think I sent any CV or like yeah. I think um you just like because we just connected already like via this um automation guild conference. So like we were already connected via Twitter, and I think this is where. Um, like one of the benefits of like learning in public really came into play because um I was just you know publishing constantly. I was you know talking at various meetups and conferences already, but I was just doing all of this like as part of my you know side projects. Like it wasn't part of my day to day um role um on um on my previous job. So. When you explain to me what a developer advocate is, I'm like, oh yeah, I've been doing that on the side. So that was my first actual, um, you know, um, um, experience of like hearing what a developer advocate, you know, does on a day to day. Because I had the same perception that I'm not a developer. How can I be a developer advocate? Um, but I think because as like. As part of our day-to-day jobs, like even if we're not writing application code, we're still writing, you know, test scripts, we're creating test automation frameworks. So I think that's really helped as well, um, transitioning into uh, this role. Um, but yeah, like I never sent any CV. I just remembered like we were talking um, a lot, like back and forth. And then I met up with, you know, a bunch of our uh, colleagues now and yeah the rest is like history again <laughs> yeah I think that there are just some people that when you meet them you click or you don't and mm-hmm. when that click happens I'm just like okay I'm gonna write her name down <laughs> I think I told you about it like for two years <laughs> we yeah, were and talking and I was like hey it's what's really, gonna yeah. happen <laughs> yeah I don't know when I think you'd be perfect for it. And you're like, okay, yeah. but it's kind of early to be telling me, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, but let's just keep in touch, you know, yeah. um, and it worked out. I, I can't believe it actually did. <laughs> yeah. So and maybe now we're doing, we yeah. Actually, yeah, we go haven't on. actually defined what a developer advocate is. <laughs> yeah, I guess like we can both, you know, share what our, you know, 
view is of a developer advocate. So um, to me, when it comes to developers, I guess, trying out, you know, new tools or learning about new things, they feel most comfortable talking to someone who's actually use, you know, the product or, you know, the tool that they want to use. So we are, the, um, you know, that person. So we're helping developers, we're helping testers when it comes to, I guess, learning about best practice, um, um, recommended practices, learning about different tools. So we're kind of like a bridge between the community and like the company that we work for. Um, there's a lot of misconception that people think that we're salespeople, but we're actually not. Like it's a completely different you know, role, we are focused more on the community side, helping them grow, um, helping them, you know, I guess, in some ways, like be some sort of champions as well. So they can also promote like, you know, the different tools, the different practices that we have been communicating to them. Um, but yeah, what about you? Is that like, sort of the same um, concept? Yeah, I agree with everything you said, especially about being a bridge. Because mm -hmm. as a developer advocate, you're not quite a developer. That's not our primary responsibility. But yeah. we're also not like marketers or salespeople, although there's an overlap there in both. I kind mm -hmm. of think of it as anti-marketing. So mm -hmm. a marketer is going to be talking about something that they themselves have never used, are not the target user for, and yeah. might not know much about in terms of the technical details. A developer yeah. advocate is someone who actually is the target user. So for those who don't know, Marie and I work at Grafana Labs specifically on K6, which is a performance testing tool, but we have both used K6. We have both been testers and still are. And so there are things that we can suggest. Part of it is advocating internally, we mm -hmm. advocate for testers everywhere to the product team so that we say, like, these are the features that we would be looking for as testers. Like, we would mm -hmm. say it this way, or we wouldn't really use that feature. We want this other one. But another part of it is advocating externally. So it, this is the part that people think of as marketing. But I think of it as anti-marketing because we're not going out there and saying, hey, you should use this product that we yeah. never used before. Instead, we build cool things and demonstrate cool things that we have done, not some other yeah. developer. Like we do our demos. And then yeah. when people ask us, then we say, oh, yeah, we used K6. So I don't know. Marketing definitely has its place, but for me, I am so addicted to that authenticity and genuineness that comes from just talking about a tool that you actually love, which is yeah. what K6 is for me. Yeah, I I, I really like that because uh, for me, an important part of, you know, this advocacy is like, communicating something that I truly believe in like I'm not going to advocate for you know a tool that I haven't used like I, I would just feel like you know I'm a fraud if I do that so if I know that you know there are situations where um, a certain tool or a certain practice you know would work better then I would advocate for you know that as well so it's not just about you know for example um, like at the moment we can't do K6 for accessibility and I'm an accessibility advocate as well. So I would go and, you know, recommend like other tools and practices based on what like I've experienced based on what I've done. And I think like for me, that's one of the um, biggest like advantage because yeah, I if, if I've been put on the spot and say, hey, you should talk about this tool and promote it to other people, that would just totally go against my like one of my beliefs. I think I also really appreciate that this position lets us shine a light on people like us who mm -hmm. maybe who don't look like the average person in tech. I know it's still I've been lucky to work with teams of of mainly men that haven't treated me any differently because because I'm a woman, but there is still like a sense of being other. Yeah. 
And, and I guess being that in a position of advocacy means that we're we're also able to appeal to other women who who maybe didn't who didn't have as good an experience as as we did. Yeah. And I guess that really leads um to this next question and you know people who will watch this in the future might also ask like what are the expectations like for this podcast like why are we doing this <laughs> um so do you want to maybe why start are we from- doing <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah so do you want to start like from your side like what are the expectations that you know um that we can yeah share to people Sure. I think that you and I both do a lot of technical advocacy. We, you know, do demos, we write scripts, and we tell people how to do things in tech, very technical things. But I think that there's a whole other side of tech that doesn't get talked about. And that's like things like interpersonal dynamics or cultural differences. You and I are both Europeans that have to work in in our situation, predominantly American um, space. And we're also Asian. So balancing the two, you know, we, we are on different sides of the spectrum on that. Just also the general stress that comes with tech. It is not easy, not just as a developer advocate, but just to be in tech, to keep up with changing trends. I feel like there are so many emotional aspects and psychological aspects that don't get talked about that I would really like to cover. Then also, I kind of alluded to it, I would like to make it a little bit more open, uh, an open discussion for particularly underrepresented people Mm -hmm. like ourselves. We identify with with several minority groups and maybe help them along a bit by telling them things that we we had to find out the hard way early on in our career. How about yeah. you? Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with all of those. And I guess it's also to just have a safe space, you know, for everyone just to share their experiences in tech. Um, like you said, there's this whole other side of tech that we don't talk about that maybe other women are also uncomfortable to talk about, you know, with like, I guess other colleagues, especially if it's just predominantly male. So we want to, you know, have a safe space for them, share, you know, um, you know, I guess from from their side, like their unique experiences as well. And maybe like we can all have, I, I mean, m- maybe we also have those shared experiences that we don't talk about. But then when someone says, oh yeah, I've experienced that too. So it's just really finding you know, shared experiences that we can all relate to. And like you said, just helping them, you know, or empower them to, um, I guess, um, move forward in terms of like the next uh, stage in their career. Like, you know, share what's worked for us, share what hasn't worked for us. Because I think it's all about like being authentic as well. And not just talking about the good things, but we can also talk about the bad and the negative things as well. I'm excited to see where we go from here. Um, I think we have a lot of ideas about where we're going to take this, and I hope people will come along for the ride. Yeah. So, yep, I guess this is um, it for the first episode. Um, We are just, you know, extremely excited to um, do this on a regular basis. So we'll talk about different, you know, topics in every episode. And we might, you know, have, like, really awesome, like, guests as well um, in future episodes. So, yeah, I guess just uh, stay tuned. And, yeah, look out for for adobo and avocados. (laughs) Thanks, everyone. See you next time. Bye-bye.